by Rich TV Live. Hi, how's everybody doing today? This is your host, Rich from Rich TV Live, and I'm here with a very special guest. It's Greg Safrensky, who is the IR consultant for International Montoro Resources, Inc. How are you doing today, Greg? I'm quite fine, thanks, Rich. I'm very excited, just... to, I'm very excited to speak with you today, Greg. Uh, yesterday, we did a video introducing International Montoro Resources to our community. The stock went wild, had a really big day traded millions of shares. Today was up earlier. It finished, I guess it's kind of unchanged right now, but it's traded over 700,000 shares again today. And yeah, what I think I thought, we're, just about, we're just about to hit the million mark now. Perfect. And what I thought today would be a good idea is to go over some of the materials uh, with you because you're more of a mining expert and resource expert than I am. And maybe just break it down in layman's terms so people can understand exactly how big of an opportunity this is. That's exactly... I consider myself a stock shaman, and what I do is I translate, translate geological, geophysical speak into plain English. <laughs> so I like that. Let's, let's, let's start ahead. I worked on a PowerPoint here. Let's see if we can get it going. Sure. So let's get it started, and we're going to share right now. So this is... This is, an, this is what happens when you let me play with the computer. <laughs> 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 so why don't we start with this? What is this exactly that we're looking at right now here in Okay, Ontario? so this is from the Government of Ontario, Ontario Geological Survey. Uh, it's a Google, um, it's a Google uh, uh, add-on, and anybody can access this. It's uh, through uh, Earth, Google Earth. And what you have there in the center, uh, that thatch work, that's the P-course anomaly. And that thatch work you see there is the uh, lines of the, uh, uh, the geotech, geophysical, flew with their helicopter over our um, Peacorse Lake Anomaly. Wow. And uh, can you explain the importance of Elliott Lake? I know that there's been a lot of resource companies in that quick, region. Quick history. Elliott Lake for a time was the uranium capital of the world. Um, wow. Wow. Uh, I'm sure in the nuclear arsenal in the United States, they still got uh, material <laughs> from Elliott Lake. Wow. It really ran for, there was Denison and Real Algamin, which is, uh, Real Algamin is Real Tinto. It was just the Canadian uh, uh, division was called Real Algamin. They mined there for a better part of 40 years. Wow. Um, about 2006, 2006, 2007. Uranium prices uh, catapulted from nine to like uh, over a hundred dollars a pound, wow. and so we acquired the ground. They um, don't have the claim groups here, but we acquired the ground that was reserves left over from uh, Real Algamin's mine, which was roughly about fifteen million pounds of uranium. It was already so when you have a mine, you want to ha have drilled ahead of your production at least two years of production for that mine. So we acquired half of the half of, half of the reserves. Uh, moving forward in 2011, uh, there was a big, uh, big scare for rare earth. Uh, the Chinese had delayed shipping the rare earth sh shipments, and so there was a big, uh, big push for to find rare earths outside of China. And uh, we ran our, we ran, uh, we ran our assays for a uranium drilling program there. And surprise. We didn't have a uranium deposit. We had a rare earth deposit. There was like three times more rare earth in, the, in that ore than there was uranium, but we'd never tested for it before. Wow. That's impressive. Um, moving forward, historically, um, uh, we did, you see the pink, all that pink in the background, that's, that's uh, around behind, underneath the snatch. Uh, the thatch work there. Yeah, that's the uh, that's our VTEM survey that we flew about 2009, um, just to get a get a feel get a feel of uh, where we could. The VTEM is a uh, magnetic uh, survey, is flown by an airplane, so we get a feel like where how our uranium ground was. Um, you know, if we can see some because we have more than just the reserves, we we acquired a whole bunch of ground in that area. Wow. I think we're right now we're the largest land land holder claim holder in the Elliott Lake camp. Wow, so, that's impressive. So we did, so when we flew this, that big pink area you see under the that's what showed up. 
And uh, we were very excited, of course. Like, so we went to the Ontario Geological Survey in Sudbury, and we said to them, let's go to the next slide. Sure. Uh, scroll down. Said, yeah. Okay, so this, now this is, a, this is the same uh, VTEM, which is a magnetic sensing, de de magnetic sensing, you're looking for magnetic things. What are magnetic things, you ask? I will tell you. There's three primary ferromagnetic uh, elements. One, of course, is iron. The other one's nickel. And the, and the third is cobalt. So if you're flying a magnetic survey, and this is this the one you showed before was our VTEM survey that the OGS took from us and put on their database. This is the ZTEM showing the magnetic fields. So... When, you, when you're looking at this thing, you got to go, that, that is, between every little box, every little line there going north and south, it's between those lines, two clicks, two kilometers. Wow. So you're looking at something in the Enormous. range of, you know, many kilometers long. Wow. The center point there, the key point is where the big one in the middle is. Let's, let's try it. So this is the same data set sensing for magnetic anomalies as a VTEM, but this, is, this was from our recent survey by Geotech in 2018, uh, helicopter survey. Again, this is, this is, they're looking for magnetic anomalies, and so we've really got a really good picture of it now. Let's go to the next slide. Sure. Magnetic anomalies, I like yeah, that. So I was looking at this picture, very well, interesting picture here. So now we, so, so you got, uh, this this data will have two. You're going to get two things, Rich. Uh, one is, of course, magnetism. Things that are magnetic: the iron, the uh, nickel, and the cobalt. Now, when we first showed that VTEM data to the well, very. I mean, the people at the uh, at the Ontario Geological Survey, which is a division of uh, Northern Mines Ontario, it's a government-run organization, and we told them, "Hey, you know." Uh, we got this VTEM, it just shows a magnetic anomaly, and, and then it's, and we'll see it coming in the coming slides, but it's also centered on a huge gravity anomaly. Now, why would a gravity anomaly be interesting? Well, something is buried, buried below our property, is so dense, it affects gravity. And this was a survey done by the Canadian government in the 60s. So what we're looking at here now is uh, again, the two different things, uh, the gravity anomaly is a, it, we'll see the picture coming up, but what you're looking here is it shows the magnetic anomaly. Uh, we'll go into the other thing later. So this is about five kilometers long, easy two kilometers tall, easy uh, two kilometers across. It is, and I've been in the business since 85, that's in 1985. And I've never seen anything this consequential in size. It's, it's almost biblical. So you can see in this graphic, the red holes are the holes that we drilled in 2015. And the blue holes are drilled by uh, Real, Real Tinto's uh, you know, Canadian division, Real Algerman, in the same spot in about 1956. So in 1956, without all this technology, they figured out to poke some holes there that there was something below there, but they didn't quite find it. Let's look at the next slide. So here's a satellite shot. And uh, this is what it looks like, you know, without the, all the yada yadas, uh, the data. And um, in a couple of spots where we drill our holes, we drilled two holes. One hole we drilled was a, a kilometer, 1,000 meters. And the second hole, which is the one uh, in the middle, and, this, and the 2015 two, that's the second hole, uh, we drilled that one 1,317 meters. That's 1 1.3 kilometers. It's almost 6,000 feet. And th the pain will come on the next few slides. This is for our 2015 pro, uh, program trying to hit that anomaly that we saw in the previous slide. Next slide, please. Again, here's the, th here's, here's the lines that the helicopters flew, uh, both north and south and east and west. 
there's a big basket that hangs under the helicopter that, uh, that, that, that when they fly these lines, so you know where they, where they flew and all back and forth. In fact, they flew this survey twice to make doubly sure that they, um, they got all the data correctly. And it, usually they can do it in the afternoon, but the geotech guys, they, they wanted to get something. They knew they, were, they could tell they were onto something big, so they double flew it. So this data is for about, and they spent two weeks there, which usually take them an afternoon. So that that's, tells you a little bit that uh, the, 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 what they saw, these, what they saw, what you're seeing now, is something that they'd never seen before. Now, geotech's been around for decades, and we'll go on to more about them later. Next slide, please. So we've now this. When I mentioned there's there's two there's two things you you want to sense from these helicopter survey is the first one's the magnetic. So that's all the magnetic material. The magnetic material. And uh, this one is, as you can see below on the bottom there, it says resistivity. Okay, now resistivity is a measure of conductivity. The least resistance the material, the more conductive the material. So when you t as when we're talking about magnetic anomalies, that's a different scale, a different sensor. This is conductivity where well, you're measuring for conductive minerals, not, mag not magnetic minerals. So... Uh, this is this shows you where there might be conductive metals and what are those conductive metals you ask? I'll tell you copper gold silver platinum palladium rhodium some nice stuff <laughs> so So this is uh, in this particular picture. We see we see superimposed on the so you're looking at it from the north uh, Basically the tip of the anomaly you're, you're underground looking at the anomaly in this picture uh, This is how good the data is and you can see the front of the beginning tip of the anomaly. And uh, that line that goes down there, that is uh, the 1300 meter hole we drilled. And, uh, and go to the next slide, and might as well get over the pain. This is very interesting, Greg. This so, looks really big. It, it's looks really like big. It's now, this is a painful slide for me and the directors. We had took the VTEM data, you know, in that first picture, you can see that it's on the, uh, the government of Ontario bought it from us. So there's BTM data. And then we did the, the helicopter thing on top of that. But now we've got the data from the ZTEM in the 2D graphic here. Again, we're underground looking at the anomaly. And you see those two lines, those two arrows that come down? That's our drill holes. <laughs> and, and you can see on the second hole, we just skimmed the outside of the yellow layer. That's like we just we just skim the halo of this massive yeah, anomaly, which is it. like five you kilometers just long. Just missed it. You just missed. We, it. I mean, we just missed it. That's, I mean, it, it's very agonizing. We downhole probed, and this is a device you drop down the hole, and it and uses IP and magnetic. It's the same thing as a helicopter, but it uses the same devices to sense conductivity and magnetic elements nearby. And uh, yeah. We're two, maybe 300 feet away from the goodies. That's, and these were not cheap holes. Uh, I tell you, uh, I, in my, and I've been around since 85, never drilled a 1300 meter hole. So we thought it was down there, but uh, we didn't hit it, which is bad news for us, good news for the investor. <laughs> Let's go to the next slide. Now, in this shot, it's again, you can see this on the Ontario Geological Survey's website, their Earthlink site. You're looking at the, previous we saw the sort of long banana shaped uh, VTEM. This is the Canadian government's gravity survey. So you can see uh, that there's a, something massive there. The pink is, is it's, it's so dense, it's affected gravity, can be sensed from a plane flying over. So that's, this is the gravity anomaly in the area we are. Uh, which is again a measure, you know, basically again to say why is it why is it important? Because something is so dense in this area uh, that it affects gravity, and so if you have, and this one we went back to in, when we did the VTEM, we talked to the OGS people in Sudbury. We said, well, we've got this gravity anomaly, and it's right on top of this massive, um, you know, VTEM anomaly. Uh, we, what do you think we got? And they said, don't get excited. Because that's also what you could have is iron. 
and no one's going down a thousand feet to get iron. Then we go forward in time. Next slide, please. So this is a this is this is a, just a historical background. Now here we have uh, the, again this is uh, the resistivity, the measure of conductivity, and we have the Z two and Z one that we that is discussed in our most recent news release. Uh, I do recommend the investors to do as much due diligence as possible. Uh, and read the news release. There's quite a bit of information that we took a long time in, in uh, composing that that news release, so you get the stuff. So we see the Z two, Z two, and the Z one again. These are kilometers long, and uh, it it gives us a clue. And if we go to the next, it gives us a clue. Is okay. So if we drill here, there's conductive minerals, and those might be some juicy ones. You know, gold, silver, platinum, etc. If we drill over here, we, we're going to get into the magnetic anomaly, which we, we know because going back to the OGS, and I didn't put this on our database, but if, if investors go to our website, you'll find our PowerPoint presentation. And in 2010, the government of Ontario's geological survey did a geochem above, above our anomaly, uh, which was very nice. It would cost us hundreds of thousands of dollars. And... The result of that was, and I, I'm quoting from the, I'm quoting from the uh, OGS Geochem report. At, this is by uh, the, the geophysicist Dreyer, is the author of this very extensive, uh, and again, it's on our website, the OGS uh, Geochem. He says, and this is a guy from Sudbury. Now, I don't know about, you can know about Sudbury, but uh, at one point, Sudbury was the nickel mining capital of the world. There's about 14 isn't, mines. Isn't there. there? Isn't that where they have that big nickel? Yeah, yeah, that's where they get the big nickel. I've seen that big nickel in Sudbury. Yeah, <laughs> and they moved it though. I, I I went looking for it last time I was there, and it wasn't by the highway where I thought where it used to be. They moved it somewhere. Anyways, so we are about as crow flies, maybe 50 miles to the uh, to the west of Sudbury. Now we're on the same latitude. So uh, now to give me an idea how rich Sudbury is between how much they've mined and how much they know it's in the ground, it's over a trillion dollars, and that's U.S. dollars. So we, we, looked, we got the geochem, and, you know, at this point in time, we didn't have, you know, we looked it over and went, holy cow. And then we read in the report where the guy says, at P-Course, at P-Course lies a Sudbury-like occurrence, but of higher intensity. So going back, the wealth of the wealth of Sudbury the mining camp is a trillion dollars. Here's a guy that's been doing geochem surveys for the OGS for over 33 years, and these are the he goes every summer all around the sub. We're in the Sault Ste. Marie mining camp. The Sudbury mining camp is is almost on this picture. There's a line there. But it's like we're just at the border. So this guy's been doing in the in the Sudbury mining camp doing geochems and. And Sudbury's, again, has got 14 nickel mines there. I'm a little touch, up, touch with the investors about geochem. There is a thing, and it's a thing. It's called mobile metal ions. And what occurs is that you'll have underneath you a deposit of dust matter. It's iron, nickel, cobalt, whatever it is. And over time, well, magically, I don't have any other explanation. Over time, ions from those individual elements, elements will come to the surface and get caught in uh, lake sediments or river or stream sediments. It's beautiful. So these guys went by with using helicopters and dinghies and that, and they spent about a month on top of our property getting samples from all the little lakes and streams. You can see some of them there. There's Hog Lake, Peacors Lake. And then with above us, where, where our anomaly is, there's a vast amount of lakes, small lakes, the ponds, marshes, etc. And they measure 20 centimeters down into the sediment. And the reason they did that is so because we're close to Sudbury and, you know, we could get pollution that would carry other elements, maybe come over to where we are, and uh, we'd, you know, we'd spoil the sample. So these guys went down 20 centimeters and took the sample. And like I said, it's the best results the guy's had in his career, right above our anomaly. Uh, it's very prospective for nickel, copper, cobalt, basically the periodic table. We can all, you can look at the geochem and say, if we drill here, 
there's a good chance we're going to find titanium. If we drill here, there's a good chance we're going to find, and this is going back to the conductivity side of things. As you can see that scale on the bottom from 425 to 10,000 or 100,000, uh, 410. What you're looking for is a low number. Low number means less resistance. Elements have less resistance like copper. They have good conductivity. So the geochem shows us some magical things that we're going to have put on a 3D graphic as well. Uh, the, so you can drill here. If you drill it in the first, in the first say, um, five, 500 meters, a kilometer of this five kilometers, the conductivity indicates that we, and the geochem indicates that we'd, we'd be hitting vanadium, titanium, chromium, uh, um, and then but for about a, about a two kilometer stretch, it's bozo box office for rare earth, lithium, and uranium. Yeah, but in the one end where the where it's the the gravity is the densest and where the magnetic anomaly is, right above the lakes above that huge gold, platinum, um, nickel, copper, cobalt, uh, palladium. I mean, beautiful stuff. Our drill hole when we just skim the side of this anomaly, uh, we got uh, we got uh, uh, nickel, copper and palladium and platinum. The ratio of palladium to platinum was four to one. Palladium is, I think, the high flyer right now uh, in, in, the, in the element market. I think it's worth more than gold. So that's, that's it. So we're taking, all, we're taking all the pieces. We've taken all the pieces now over time. Uh, magnetic anomaly, uh, gravity anomaly, government sinks maybe it's iron. They do the geochem, turns out ain't no iron there at all. We drill, we we miss. Then we brought, then we did this helicopter survey, and this valley, this data is like seeing through rock. What you see in in these graphics, go to the next one, Richard, please. What you see in this what you see from Geotech and their helicopter ZTEM survey. Uh, this one here, I think, yeah, you see that, uh, Rich? If you go back, please. I couldn't get this to work, but if you can just cut and paste that YouTube video into the browser, uh, I don't know if you can do that. That link there. No one allow me to cut and paste. Uh, but I, I don't, and I can't see my thing. Anyways, you'll find this. This is a, a, a 3D GIF sort of video. Uh, of that shows both the magnetic and the IP, the conductivity, resistivity anomalies in, in its completeness. And it spins around, it shows where the drill holes are. Please visit the website, it's right there on the Serpent River page, that's the project page that we're on. What I can do is, um, we can do another video, uh, maybe kind of showing that video. Yeah, okay, I can, I can put that, I don't know how, I don't with, with this thing here. Anyways, moving along, let's have a look at the next slide. That's, that's the closer, that's the spinning one. I just couldn't get it up here. Talking about geotech. Now, geotech is in Ontario, Aurora, Ontario, and they do a great deal of work for Valley. And Valley, if you don't know, is one of the biggest mining companies in the world. Um, I think the Brazilian government gets a lot of money from Valley's activities. Uh, Valet has a variety of mines. The peak of the the pick of the bunch of the peak and pack is the Voise Bay mine in Labrador. Voise Bay, the discovery thereof, is the biggest single discovery in Canada in the last fifty years. So, having said that, it was it was discovered late nineteen ninety nine. It was bought by Inco for four billion dollars, uh, wow. an unparalleled value, and this like in 1999, for four billion dollars. Now Inco became Valley. So it's the same, so, so when they merged together, now they, they used to be, for a while they're Inco Valley, now they're just Valley. What we're looking at here, and blessed we are to have this data, is the uh, geotechs, VTEM, ZTEM survey, helicopter survey of the Voise Bay mine. And you'll see off to the left, there's a red area, a little bit higher in the middle, and then there's another red area to the right. Those are the ovoid and the eastern deeps uh, deposits. Right now, Rich, they are spending 
two billion dollars Canadian to access those two red dots on the left there. One's about 550, me 550 meters down. The ovoid is about a hundred. Is like an oval. It's uh, 300 meters in, in circumference and about a hundred meters thick. The one to the right, that's the Eastern Deeps. Uh, it's uh, it's like a tube about 800 meters long, about 40, 40 meters in circumference. So they're sinking one shaft to get to the ovoid, and they're sinking another shaft to get to the eastern deeps. So this is where the trick comes in, because now Valley does not share this data. This went into a, a scholastic paper written by some pretty prestigious geophysicists and geologists, reviewing, which probably gone into a textbook somewhere. The Valley let 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 Valley allowed for the release of their of this data. Uh, for this paper. So now we get to look behind the curtain and this is an absolute blessing for us and, and it's a key thing for the your investors. So they're spending two billion bucks to get to those two red dots. Okay, those two red dots and again we know that a measure of magnetism uh, is measure, a measure of ma magnetism is what you're looking for, magnetic minerals and that's what they're looking at here is uh, magnet is uh, you know, nickel, copper, cobalt. There's only th there's only the three things. And uh, in the eastern deeps, we have the data. It's about 2.7 percent nickel, half a percent copper, half a percent cobalt. And they're spending a billion bucks to get there. The now there is a scale, and you know it's all about the score and the chalkboard and how many yards you got to go to the touchdown. Thing, this is the thing, Greg, that always worried me about mining and resource companies. And I know you said that resource companies are about to explode. Is the amount of money they spend on drilling and, and, and digging, do you think that's a problem? Well, I, I'm going to cover that a little bit later. And it, it has been a significant problem for the last 10 years. But I'm going to cover that later. Uh, we're going to the key thing here, folks, is that we're looking at the eastern deeps. You see that little spot there uh, in the bottom on the right there where it's got the arrow that goes down? Uh, the, the picture of, on the left and the picture on the right and then the little like uh, dot there. That's the eastern deeps. It's only 40, 50 meters across. Now let's go back up again. Let's go back up to uh, one of those awful pictures where we missed the hole. Pass this one. That's the gravity. We get to the one where we missed the hole. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Okay, stop, stop, stop. Okay, so <laughs> there is a measure of magnetism. And it has the delightful scale of being referred to as nano Teslas. Nano Teslas. Small and big T. Now <clears throat> the Eastern Deeps, we got the nano Teslas on that. It's 41,000. The bigger number, the better on uh, nano Teslas. So we saw the picture from, um, from, uh, from Valley's uh, Boise Bay mine, the Eastern Deeps. That one's 41,000 nano Teslas. And we know it's 2.7% nickel. And we know it's uh, half percent copper. And we know it's. Uh, you know, the size of it, we know it's in there is a half a percent cobalt. The size of those ones you're looking at, the bigger one on the left here, the one just beside where we missed, is uh, in the neighborhood of a kilometer across and a kilometer thick, as opposed to the Boise Bay Eastern Deeps, which is about 400 meters tall, 400 meters thick. 40, sorry, 40 to 50 meters tall, 40, 40 to 50 meters across. This one is a kilometer around. It's, it's, it's 10, 20 times larger. It's just enormous. I can't believe how big it is. Uh, it's, that's okay, but, but I can't stress how accurate this geotech uh, ZTEM survey is. It's deadly accurate. You can almost, it can almost, if you have a scale to measure by, you know what, you kind of get a clue as to what you're going to find when you get there. I, would, I've, I was at uh, the Roundup here in British Columbia. It's, um, it, it's mostly for miners, and there's a lot of geologists and geophysicists to go there because they have ongoing 
uh, learning seminars. So I got to talk to a lot of geophysicists at the Roundup about six weeks back here in BC at the convention center. And I brought my dad out and I says like, no. So it says, uh, it just says, have you ever heard of something as high as 57,000 nanotesla? Because, you know, we know that the Eastern Deep's 41,000, and they're spending you know, roughly a billion dollars to sink a shaft there. And we have 57,000. So what does that tell the, the, to make that, you know, plain speak? So we are comparing, it's an easy comparison between us and Boise Bay. If we have 57,000, and I've asked about, and I'm getting a paper written, actually just having a conversation with a geophysicist about this, and he's going to go out there and find the stuff I couldn't find, but it is an unparalleled result. No one has gotten this kind of result anywhere on this planet at this time. And I'm going to get a geophysicist to write a report that's going to say that. And what do we know? If it's, if it's got more magnetism, it's going to have more nickel and co cobalt. And we know the size and we know the, the magnitude of the, of the nanoteslas. So it's all, but all the buttons are pushing to one thing. It, this could very well be something as big or if not bigger than Boise Bay. And again, it was acquired for 4 billion bucks. It's been operational since 2005. And they're spending another 2 billion bucks to get down to the, to the deposits. So what so does that mean? Uh, what does that mean for investors in this company? Like, do you the you, potential? You know, we've been in this game for a long time. This is a six cent stock. I mean, what do you think? Like, what kind of upside does an investor well, have here? I, you know, like I was around, and I made a great deal of money, uh, and I was I used to be palsy with uh, this guy named Robert Friedland, uh, mm -hmm. and he had and he had formed this company called Diamond Fields, and uh, at the time Chuck Fipke had discovered. Diamonds in the Northwest Territories, and the stock went from pennies to $72. Uh, you know, so Robert Friedland, he's comes in, he comes in and says, like, if there's diamonds in the Northwest Territories, there's going to be diamonds in Labrador. <laughs> so he staked a, a section of ground in, in uh, Labrador about the size of France. And his master plan was to get four geologists and two helicopters and just start flying lines looking out the window see if they can see a kimberlite pipe to go looking to, to find the diamonds i can't make this stuff up this is fact in the course of them flying back and forth these two geologists see something but it's not on diamond fields property they land the helicopter hit took a pick hit the ground bang took a sample that was it they discovered boise bay took them about a couple months and they got and then uh, friedland bought that claim from them even though he was working, these guys were working for him, but they were on his claim, so these guys claimed it. Sold it to, uh, to Diamond Fields. Diamond Fields drilled it. The stock started at 30 cents. It closed, it, it, when it, by the time it was taken over by Inco, $156 a share. It is probably the unparalleled uh, Canadian stock uh, in the mining sector for that. I don't know how many thousands of uh, percentage points, but I made a great deal of money. Uh, trading the stock back in the day. So what does it mean to the investors? Well, you can't turn back time. You can't buy that 30, 30 cent diamond field stock before the nickel discovery. But I'm showing you where we have empirical imperial data that shows that we are right on top of and just about, and we're moving forward to, to drill this target that is much larger than the Eastern Deeps or the ovoid combined from the Boise Bay mine, and has a higher mag, uh, magnetic signature. Again, the numbers are 41,000 for the Eastern Deeps, 57,000 for the one you see on your screen. So the more magnetic it is, the richer it will be with it for minerals that are magnetic, and they are iron, nickel, and cobalt. And we know from our drilling and from the geochem, it's not iron. So we could very well, and this is, a, this is just potential, there's no, nothing's written in stone, but you can see by the data sets that we've put together that it's like a, it's like a sleuth, it's like a mystery, a mystery novel. You got clues, right? And, it's, and like you said, Rich, drilling is expensive. So you wanna be, not like us in 2015, shooting these, we're basically wildcat holes uh, down here for hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars and coming up nothing. 
we can't turn back time to, to move that drill hole over and we can't turn back time to let your investors buy uh, diamond fields at 30 cents. But here we are at, at a time that you can participate in the giant potential that we, we believe that we have. We're not just being, I mean, we're not looking at, we may, we may be looking at here what will become the next biggest single mining discovery in Canada. So that's what I'm saying. It's, there's nothing in stone. It's a lot of risk, get you that. But we've reduced the risk. We've got strong geochem numbers. We've got the VTEM numbers. We've got the ZTEM numbers. We've got gravity. It's all lined up quite nicely. The stars are aligning for the peak horse anomaly. Let's have another look at the slides here to slide through. Yeah, so let's uh, scroll down here. That's the gravity. It's gigantic. And... Uh, and this is, again, this is IP, Conductive Minerals. The video you have to visit on our website. Maybe we can tack it in later. A comparison to uh, the Eastern Deeps is, you know, you can see that. Now, here's another shot of the Eastern Deeps. Gives you an idea of the size of it. Again, you know, our, our core, the core, the indicated core for our data, uh, which is identical data that the, the the geotech used on the on the Boise Bay mine, so it the everything's the same. So this is a, another shot of uh, how big the uh, this is the Eastern Deeps, uh, Boise Bay's Eastern Deeps. You can see the size of it. You know, it's 100 meters across, maybe 100 meters tall. It's an average of about 50 meters if you take a made in a circle. It's about 50 meters, and it's uh, worth a billion. They're going to spend like they're sinking two shafts. One of these shafts is going to cost a billion bucks. It's going down there about 700, 850 meters. That Where is just we, insane. The yeah, amount of it, money they're spending, it's crazy. Yeah, it, well, why are they spending it, Rich? Because this is a, this is, this is a money machine. You, you sink that thing, and I, no one, they're not sharing, the Valley does not share this information about how much money they've made on this mine, but if they bought it for four billion, they're throwing another two billion into it, what, 2000, almost 15 years later, they're throwing another two billion into it. Yeah, it's a, it must be a very nice business. I don't think they're doing it for charity, you know what I'm saying? Sounds like a cash cow. <laughs> yeah. Let's see what we got next. Ah, just one more thing. Here we go. Next slide, please. Okay, so in the metal sector, in the mineral mining sector, there's always an element du jour. I know I'm the metal of the day, if you will. And, uh, you know, we've seen a different, gold's hot, silver's hot, you know, uranium's hot, rare earth's hot, then they're looking for scandium, now we're looking for vanadium, then cobalt gets hot, lithium gets hot. And, you know, this, there was no, this is just a, a natural progression of things as, you know, shortages occur, demand increases. And what we have here is, uh, is a nice Bloomberg graphic uh, indicating the incoming demand uh, for these, all the metals necessary in making a lithium-ion battery. And the demand is expo exponential. It is, it's just beginning to take off. And you can see, you know, as we get into, you know, 2029, 20, 2030 there, how much more nickel, aluminum, copper, lithium, uh, manganese, all, all these elements you're going to need to fund the electrification uh, of, 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 of the car industry. And let's face it, it's happening. It's over. It's going to happen. I bought a Tesla. Get it. You know, got to get with the program. and. Uh, that you know you you can't remember. Do you know? Do you remember? Do you remember where you, where you put your last flip top phone? <laughs> nope. <laughs> oh, see, you remember you had that flip top phone and you and you flip it over and you think you're Captain Kirk and go, "Hi, how are you doing?" That I I got mine. I found mine in my drawer here. It it only took three years for for from us to go from uh, horses to cars. The demand, the demand, like cell phones exploded, and that, and then like and the Kia was the god, then Black, then Blackberry's the god, and then Apple's the god, and you know it's like 
this, these things are constantly moving. But what you don't see in the background, and specifically for the electric car industry, is the gargantuan demand that's going to come from for these minerals. It's already starting. It's driving the prices up. So it's the other side of the coin is why investors would want to look at a speculative stock like ours, even though we're an advanced explorer, is that the demand for the metals that we, dis we hope to discover is increasing and the value because of the supply and demand equation, you're going to have, uh, the prices are going to go up on these metals because in the last 10 years, I mean, we're going back to where you discussed the, the industry, in the last 10 years, we've been in a bear market for the, for the miners. Uh, peaked out 2010 at about our index, the TSX Venture, where we trade primarily. We also trade in the States. Uh, symbol in the States is IMTFF. Uh, if, you're, if you're in Germany, it's O4T1 on the Frankfurt. I guess IMT here in, in Vancouver. But uh, the TSX Venture peaked at about 2100 uh, in 2011, 2010, 2011. Uh, we've been as low as 400, and we're trading the whole index, which is a, comp which is a composite index, index. It's the value of all the 1,600 companies divided by how many shares outstanding and gives you this index, which we're about 600 now. So, in fact, we're not in a bear market in this sector. We're in a double bear market because uh, any drop of 25% is a bear market, and we've had two drops of over 25% since 2010-2011. What does that mean to the investor? It says, okay, so you want to get on the ground floor. You want to buy the stock before something happens. You want to have that knowledge or you're a trend guy and you can see like, gee, you know, I think, you know, all these electric cars and windmills and, uh, you know, solar panels, uh, you know, they're becoming the norm. And when, you know, when the uh, ice vehicle, the gas guzzler goes away to the foot bone, uh, is there a profit to be made? Yes, there is. And, you know, you want to buy when nobody wants it. You buy low, sell high. So you're coming into a... 100% like agree with you, Greg. 100% agree. You know, you, you don't chase the market. You like that stock at 5 cents? Do you like it at 25 cents? Did you miss 500% profit because you thought about it too long? Did you see the trend? Now here on the next graphics, I'm going to show you the trend. This obvious trend, that's from Bloomberg. This is from um, uh, Bridge, uh, Benchmark Minerals, who's uh, become the leader for the pricing of these, again, the, we call it the fourth industrial revolution, electrification of the ice, ice vehicles, green energy, solar, yada, yada, wind. So here they got uh, lithium is, a, you know, yellow, caution. This is the demand from now to 24, this is from like now to the next five years. Nickel's a red light. Why is nickel a red light? Now, well, because in the last 10 years, you haven't done any investment in exploration of nickel because we've been in a 10-year bear market. Nobody wants, everybody wants to throw their money at Bitcoin and Ethereum and pot deals and CBD deals. You know, it's like, no. Uh, and, and that lack of funding into this area is brought about a near-term shortage. And in um, right now, the, there's only one market for there's two markets. You can trade nickel in London Metal Exchange and also in the New York uh, Commodity Exchange. It's the same. It's the same. You're dealing with the same pot, the same warehouse of nickel. Now, when we drilled in 2015, uh, uh, nickel prices had come from about four bucks and hit a high of nine. And the reason that was was classic supply and demand. Uh, that the warehouse was down to about 200,000 tons. Now, a company called Roskill, which is sort of a think tank for the mineral industry, they, they've calculated that the demand for electric vehicles for the production of lithium-ion batteries, and if you don't know this, uh, Elon Musk has said this, is that they shouldn't be called lithium-ion batteries. They're prime, they really are nickel graphite batteries. That's the major components in these, in these batteries. And if you... And what they're doing is cobalt being a, let's call it, for lack of better terminology, a blood mineral uh, coming from the Congo, questionable mining, children working, yada, yada. So they increase the chemistry. They put more nickel in and less cobalt. And, uh, and that's, the, that's the trend going forward. 
Is it, they got like they started at three one one three parts nickel, one part cobalt, one part manganese, and now they're going upwards to eight and nine parts nickel, one part. So you your proportion in that battery for cobalt, use of cobalt drops as the nickel increases. But so that's that's what it is. There is right now on. Uh, like a guy, Simon Moore from Benchmark, and who put this graphic together, was speaking to, and this is in our news release that came out yesterday, uh, was speaking to the Senate subcommittee on minerals and, uh, and, and oil. All the senators are brought him in because he's an authority. And he said that uh, all these minerals you see there, he said that to the senator says, you produce none of them. <laughs> none of them. He says, and this is the second. Uh, this is the second trip in uh, in um, giving testimony to the senators at this at this uh, resource commission, uh, the Senate, sub Senate subcommittee. And he says, I was here 19 months ago. There were seven mega factories under construction at that time. As of his, and he only gave this. this is just like weeks ago. He gave this his testimony. He says, and this is what he said. There were seven. 17 going, uh, sorry, mis misquoted. There's 17 mega factories. The biggest one, of course, is Tesla's Giga One. And uh, CATL has one of about the same size as China. He says, all these minerals, America produces zero. It all comes from outside of the country. Wow. I wasn't and aware he said, we went from 17, he was there like 18, 19 months between the two testimonies. He went from 17 to, and now there are 71 of these Giga factories. The wow. demand is Incredible. exponential. And how do you participate? You can chase Tesla stock or you can buy some other battery deal. But the guys, are, the guys are going to coin the money are the miners. And, you know, we're not a miner yet. But we could be a thousand feet from making a Boise Bay-like discovery. The data shows us that. And, again, to reiterate... It's the biggest score in mining in the last 50 years versus the Boise Bay. So the, the potential for upside is there. The entry point in the stock is laughable at, you know, this, at this price range. You know we only have 27 million shares of. So, you know, the, the upside potential is very, very much there. Let's have a look at the next slide. Nickel deficit is a saw rating. He, uh, uh, Scott Moore from Benchmark said that uh, the demand for nickel from now to 2024 will go 19 times, 19 times. And here in this graphic, we look at the uh, nickel supply demand uh, and market times. balance. We're going to go into a deficit pretty soon. Like it, we we're drawing down on the inventories at the London Metal Exchange. They've, in the la I've looked at the charts. The amount of nickel sitting in the warehouse that you can buy is the lowest level that it's ever been. It's, I can only see the chart back 10, 10, 12 years. It's never been under 200,000 tons. Ross Kill, the, the mineral think tank, they say the demand for lithium ion batteries is going to increase the overall yearly demand for nickel by two to 300,000 tons. Well, where the hell is this 200, 300,000 tons coming from? Because the warehouse in London has under 200,000 tons and it's going down every day. Uh, the price of nickel has increased 25% this year. It's come from 480 to six bucks. So, wow. yeah, so it, far in 2019. You've got to read the trend, you've got to see the signs. You know, nickel could go like, could go berserk. Copper. Again, Robert Friedland, the guy I talk about, the, the own diamond fields, discovered Boise Bay. He made, they got, they, he, his company got paid four billion bucks for the Boise Bay mine. Guess how much Robert got? 3.8 billion. <laughs> he owned 97% of the wow. shares. <laughs> That's genius. So he is a, he's a big time miner guy. He's got Ivanhoe, he's, he's got mines in China, he's got mine. you know, he's got, he went to town. Little, little, but what, 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 we didn't have the problems that, that Robert did because Robert's childhood buddy was Steve Jobs. So if he wanted some money, he just had to, I don't know if they had flip phones. <laughs> he just phoned his buddy Steve Jobs up and there was money for him. We have to work a little bit harder than uh, Robert Friedland did. So, but Robert said uh, in Forbes magazine here last week, 
that you're going to need a telescope to see copper prices in 2024, 2021. You know why? Is because it's the same thing happening in the nickel markets happening even more more in the in the copper industry the demand from electric vehicles is emptying out the warehouse and and how are you going to fill that warehouse you're going to have to go out and find more minerals in the ground and you have to open up mines and it doesn't happen overnight it's you know four you make the discovery and you'd be lucky you'd be in production in four or five years and what's going to happen in the meantime where are you going to get the nickel and copper from you know and if the demand is such, the prices for these things are going to escalate, and the demand for you know explorers that have you know, top flight uh, uh, exploration programs underway, well, there are prices. We're going to finally get our day in the sun, and we've been waiting for ten years for that. And uh, you know, I, I truly invite the investors to have a hard look at Montoro and see the opportunities that lie with, where they're within. Let's have a look at the next one. Again, I'm not quite a hockey stick, but this is China. China's already, you know, a couple of years back, they had a smog again. I mean, they, they were suffocating in Beijing. People were dying brutal. thousands a day in China. Can't breathe. Breathing, lacking of breathing brings about cardiac arrest, don't you know? And if, you oh, don't, if, you, if you can't breathe, your heart's not beating, you're dead. And that's what happened. Uh, they had a, they had a, just a horrid uh, smog attack in Beijing. The people evacuated the city, all jumped in their cars. I didn't know I saw a helicopter shot. They got like 20, 30 lane highways there. And everybody's in their car, but the cars can't go anywhere. So they're, they're trying to escape the smog and they're trapped in their cars. And they were in their cars for two days in this traffic jam. It's an unprecedented, it, it just is so they could breathe. So the government of China, in their infinite wisdom, they said, well, that's it. You know, we can't have a country if we can't breathe in it. And about two years ago, they turned their back on coal. And they, sh they were building like a coal-generated electrical plant, one a day, every day. All the ones that were being built, got shut, the construction stopped, and they shut down like 1,600 more. And this December, you know, we didn't see this. They actually turned the corner. You know why they turned the corner? Because 5% of the vehicles on the road right now are electric. And the Chinese government <laughs> is right behind this. And everybody in China is right behind it too because they like breathing. That's funny. They're funny like that. They like to breathe. Well, it's a, it's a need. It's not a want anymore. It's a need, right? They have so to for their survival. China's a big part of the, of the equation driving us forward. You know, we've had the trade war of China and America. And a lot of people thought that that was going to hurt the demand. But in fact, the, the uh, manufacturers in China, they didn't, just because there's a trade war, it doesn't mean they're still to stop building things. And surprise, surprise, the uh, copper warehouse inventories dropped and the nickel inventories dropped to record lows and the prices are going up, supply and demand. Finally, that equation is kicking in. And here's the demand for you. I mean, the penetration for electric vehicles, you might as well slide that a little bit up so people can see it, the bottom part of that chart. No, the other way, Rich, the other way. This is, these are months, <laughs> okay? These are, this chart isn't years. This is the this is the demand increase over the next year, okay? <laughs> We're going to go from 100 to 200. I mean, they, they, they are making electric buses like there's nobody's business, BYD. Our friend, uh, Mr. Buffett, owns, bought a big chunk of that. He's a smart guy. He saw the trend. Oh, God, the BYDs, they're doing, uh, oh, Chili's bought a whole fleet of electric buses. Uh, London, they got double-decker buses. They're electric, BYD buses. Um, it's, it's, you know, you got to wake up. You're not, you're, not, you're, not, you're, not, you're not ordering grass, grass for your horse. It's just anymore. a matter of time until they start having electric motorcycles. I have an ele I have two electric bicycles. <laughs> yep. yep, I'm talking they about like motorcycles. Choppers. I'm talking They're about They're like electric bicycles. choppers. I bought them. They came from China. Yeah, yeah. Electric yep. motorcycles are uh, are really a thing. Absolutely really a thing. Harley's turned their back on Harley's turned their back on the ICE engine. They're going all electric too. Jeez. Chevy says the lady running Chevy at GM. She says, you know, we're going to go all electric. That's it. There's no turning back. We're going to lose money for years, but we're turning back. We're we're going that way. 
Ford called him the, into bed with Volkswagen building a electric vehicle plant in Chattanooga. I mean, uh, the Germans, oy they the Germans. You know, after that diesel gate, they really had to dig in, okay? They did some bad, bad things. And they are turning their back on electric vehicles. I've lost track. Is it 45 billion, 100 billion? It's big money they're spending to electric to build electric vehicles. And we're going to start seeing. I think I th I know that uh, the Volkswagen, uh, Volkswagen and uh, Ford deal. They that we should start seeing some of those electric vehicles, which are kind of nice electric vehicles, uh, coming out of that Chattanooga factory. Hopefully before the end of the year. But it's the, it's the times, days is changing. You either you, you, you jump on the trend or you get left behind. Let's have the next slide. Now, nothing like a little history lesson for you. And all you pot and uh, you know blockchain and uh, Bitcoin investors, let me tell you a little story. And here it is right here. You see this chart? This is a, you gotta go up a little bit more uh, scroll it up a little bit more so you can bottom of the chart. History says now might be the time to rotate, rotate in the commodities. Now, in this chart, there's time. It's timing, right? So we see the oil crisis. We see the Gulf crisis, the crash of 2008. We don't see the crash of uh, 87 here, but that happened right before the oil crisis. The point being is. When a bubble bursts, that is your signal, your blinding light. I'm ha I've had a, an epiphany signal that when a bubble bursts, uh, it's time to go into the commodities. And that's what they're saying here. Now, I remember uh, when the, they don't have it on here. I have it on the next, the dot-com bubble. There it is, classic burst. Now, everybody's buying like dog.com and Bob's your uncle.com and you know they do they do IPOs coming out at a dollar the stock could go to twenty dollars because it was mania mania you know people were just like oh it will make a well when the bubble burst at that time all the people putting their money in these goofy dot com deals I mean there's big ones that became huge like you got the Google the Facebook yada yada Amazon but uh, a lot of them would just burn people right out and at the time of the dot com was run, was running, uh, gold was under three hundred dollars an ounce. But you wanted to buy an IPO at a dollar uh, on dog dot com <laughs> when you didn't see the trees for the forest. It says gold three hundred dollars an ounce. It's like thirteen hundred twelve twelve hundred dollars an ounce now. So when the dot com bubble burst, gold went from three hundred to eight hundred bucks. Yeah, and then if you held gold stocks, well, your multiple factor was like two three times. Those stocks went up. So that led us into uh, you know, we go to the top here, the financial crisis of 2008, another bubble bursting. Well, we, the mining sector, and when that bubble burst the, into the crash there, the mining sector had its right after that, when that bubble burst, we had the biggest run up ever, and that was in 2010, 2011, when the TSX venture got up to 2000. And so many people made so much money, they retired. I got about a half dozen friends I don't talk to anymore because they're too, they're too busy spending the money they made after the crash. You know, it, they just all got incredibly wealthy. Where are we now? Well, I think we can call Bitcoin dead. That bubble burst, 20,000 to 4,000, yeah, that's a, that's a burst bubble. And I would caution you going forward uh, on the pot deals. You know, I like pot deals. You know, I like the whole pot thing. Um, I'm heavily involved. Uh, in, in, I was heavily involved with Normal uh, to get the pot laws changed. And, yeah, we did that. So, uh, and let's just wake up and smell the coffee. I seen the ads in Oregon. So your pot stock's here gone to Oregon. And why I say Oregon, folks, when after this summer, when when Canadians come on, Canadians are going to get to grow their own pot. 
Who's going to buy pot from the internet? Who's going to go sit at a government store? Now you'll be trading your pot back and forth with your buddies. I'm growing like, I can grow plants that are three, four pounds a plant. You can let me grow four of them? I can't smoke that much pot. I'm going to trade it, right? So I say here today, gone to Oregon, I caution people about the pot bubble possibly bursting over the next 18 months is because Oregon's a perfect example. They got signs on the road there. $40 an ounce, we're paying the tax. $50 Canadian and buy an ounce of pot. I'm not growing it, I'll tell you that much. And uh, this is a cautionary note. So again, this is a graphic that sh shows when to rotate into commodities and which is like mining companies are commodities. And it's the time, the time has arise. Flip to the next one. This is Bloomberg again. It's like we don't make this up. Another one, the same chart, bang. Bubble burst by the commodities, bubble burst by the commodities, bubble burst by the commodities. And you can see on this trend line that where we are, and that's because we've been in a 10 year bear market, that's where we are now. It's time to buy. The, the, it, the signals are all here. These are historical facts. This is from uh, S&P. And you got, the, you got a double bubble burst. The pot bubble is you know, doing well. But, you know, who are the geniuses that uh, had the balls when Sessions decided he was going to attack pot to step into the pot market because all the pot stocks are going to buy them all for a, penny, for a fraction of what they're trading at now. No one had the colonies to do that. They didn't have this foresight. It was a guess. But the people that held on to their pot stocks, they really made the money. So, you know, it's all t it's timing into it. And what I'm talking about is the opportunity, historical timing for commodities. So the timing is now. The reality is, guys that are You're watching, that the moment. timing is right now. No, and it's right there on the chart. So let's have a look at another one, another slide. Folks, you can neither win or lose if you don't run the race. You don't have to buy. If you're looking at Montoro and you say, okay, yeah, I like that guy's what he's got to say. I like the company. I, the price is right. The timing's right. Commodity sector is just about to blow up. Nickel, come on, nickel warehouses, copper warehouses, they're, they're, they're at all-time lows. This is the time. You don't have to buy $100,000 of the Montoro if you want to take a position, but make sure you have a little bit. You have a little, a little bit of a, a pick up enough, not so you hurt. So this is your speculative money. This is 10% of your portfolio. I am suggesting to you a strong case to enter into Montoro, uh, put it in your portfolio. Uh, within months, we'll be drawing this thing. We hit, and like it said, Boise Bay was 30 cents. It went to $156 a share. <laughs> okay. So, do you have, uh, buying Greg, us you have, at six cents, if sorry, we go Greg, to $6 a share, I'll be ecstatic. <laughs> okay. Oh, of course. Greg, if uh, anyone was watching, are there any um, large institutional investors that are looking or are currently already in? Um, International Montoro Resources, Inc.? Uh, no. We have, um, it's, again, 10-year bear market. Uh, the herd goes one way, you know, might be off a cliff, but the herd moves one way. And uh, like here, for example, straight up, CSE at the PDAC, which I attended, uh, made a lot of investors, found a lot of new investors. Uh, the CSE had a talk and they said, okay, last year, 2018, $4 billion was raised for pot deals, 200 million for, for mining deals. So you can't go against the herd, even if the herd's heading off a cliff, but if you, you can stop and watch them. And uh, in that disproportional 4 billion to 200 million, now, you know, there's not a lot of big thinking in there, but if you, if, you know, you just take the money. If they're going to give you the money, you take it. That's, you know. I remember before this pot stock craze, it was gold. I mean, 10 years ago, it was gold. Everyone was throwing money into gold, 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 gold. Now everyone's throwing money into pot and they're forgetting about gold. They're forgetting about nickel. They're forgetting about copper. They're forgetting about lithium. They're forgetting about vanadium. You know, everything that you're talking about, you know, and I think what you're saying is 100% true. And I love, you're getting me excited. You're getting me excited about buying commodities. I'm not going to lie. It, it, well, you know, I, I'm trying to show, this what say, you guys, the timing's right. Yeah. The, the historical charts show you time and time again 
that it, and now we are at lower, so the bounce for us is going to be ginormous. And I think 2019 is the turning point that the TSX venture is going to come out of this 600 point range. If it goes to 1200 or 2000 points, there's 1600 companies that are going to double or triple. You don't have to, you know, if you find the ones that have got a good project, the ones that have hung on to their properties for 10 years through a bear, bear, a double bear market, and it scratched and, and uh, cajoled and begged investors to help fund us to move our project forward, forward bless them. Uh, that, you know, the, these are the companies that have earned your trust. You know, we, we're not two years old. We're not a new shell on the CSC that's got a CBD oil. Montoro's 35 years old. We, we haven't gone anywhere. We're here to stay, and our goal is find a mine. And it's always been find a mine. We've got other properties. We've got uranium in Saskatchewan. We've got rare earth in British Columbia. we got some uh, a, a nice, nice property in Quebec that we might have, that, that we've optioned to a mining company and that they might be taking into production. We're waiting to find out. Be nice, nice to get some revenue that we actually could tick that box. Mine, yeah, okay, we're getting mining revenue. We found that property and that mining company optioned it. Now they're mining our ground. Tick, that's, that's mining. You're getting checks for mining. That's the business. But nothing's going to beat a discovery like this. And I don't mean to put the words. It, 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 you can see from the data set how awfully close we were to making a world-class discovery. And we, you can look at the data set because we've been blessed with getting the data from Valley for Boise Bay. And we can measure ourselves to them. And we're here. They're there. <laughs> You know, they're 41,000 nanotesla, we're 57 nanotesla, 57,000 nanotesla, an unprecedented score for magnetic minerals. It's, it's a beautiful target. It's a beautiful target. I'm really thrilled and blessed to have this opportunity, but it hasn't been coming easy. I worked with this company consulting on and off for 12 years, and it's been hard slugging. Our day in the sun is coming. That's what I, I think that's it. That's all I got to say. If anybody, are we, are we live or are we not? We're just recording? Rich? Rich is lost. Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Sorry. Are we recording this live or are we, are we, on, are we just going to no, come back? No, we're recording it. It's not live, but we're recording uh, it. Okay. And all right. uh, what I did is stop the share because we went through the share. And uh, we've, been live, we've been doing this video for over an hour. So I think we should cut it out pretty soon. Yeah, I know. I'm fine. I'm fine. I, I went on too long, but that's what I'll do piece. is I'll edit the video, Greg. So yeah. any any dead air or whatever, I'll cut it. And uh, what I'm gonna do at this point mm -hmm. is uh, I'm just gonna do the the exit. So um, thank you very much for your time, Greg. Yes, thank you for having me, Rich. I really appreciate uh, this opportunity to tell our story. My pleasure, and I look forward to International Montoro Resources. We'll be watching very closely. For those of you guys that are watching, take a look at International Montoro Resources. You heard the entire explanation of why uh, Greg believes that it is at the bottom, and it has enormous upside. Thank you very much for your time, Greg. I wish you the best of luck in your future endeavors. We'll be watching International Montoro Resources very closely, IMT in Canada. And what's the U.S. symbol? It's IMTFF. Thank you guys for watching. Have yourselves a great day. Remember, if you're not winning, you're not watching. This is your boy, Rich, from Rich TV Live with Greg Safrensky, the investor relations consultant for International Montoro Resources. I'm out. Peace. Thanks, Rich. Hoo